In the Bible, there is no error in the Bible, as the Second Vatican Council pro proclaims. It's not me, it's the church. There's no error in the Bible. All it is, is we just need to look for ways to interpret that which we see there in the Bible. That's why we have the church. And so be very wary of people who try to explain biblical accounts to you and saying that they know. That is another reason why on our parish website I have provided for all of you some very good resources that you can use. Good Bible studies that will not confuse you, won't sway you in one direction or the other. The links there to some wonderful websites that I would encourage you to please check out. Pope Leo states that while studying and examining scripture is great, this should not take away from reading and taking in the text of the Bible in itself. In other words, the Bible speaks to us by itself, and when we spend so much of our effort to try to see what it is that it is saying and why, we might miss the fact that the text of the Bible is God's Word, and that this text speaks on its own. So, in other words, I was speaking to one of my friends who studied in the Biblicum in Rome, he has a doctorate in biblical studies. He is a priest in Michigan. His name is uh, Father Jose Maria Cabrera Bustamante. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was speaking to him. I'm sure you will remember his name. <laughs> and I said to him, I'm thinking of doing a, a, a Bible study. And I said, is there any resources that you think I should use? Any particular Bible study that uh, we could use? And he says, just take the scriptures and read them with the people. Let the Bible speak for itself. Let God speak to the people himself through his words. You don't need any scholars, any biblical studies, just let the Bible speak, he said. That's the best Bible study. And that's the same message for each and every one of us. The Bible is there in itself to speak to us. So read the Bible. Where do we start? We start with the New Testament, of course. I recommend it to you to start by reading the Gospel of Mark. If you do not have a Bible, there online, I have provided some on our parish website i have provided for you good links to some online bibles that i find to be very good translations of holy scripture and so if you go online you can have links there to your bible and you can start reading there but really most of us have bibles already all it is is just picking it up and reading one chapter every day and letting the Word of God speak to us. Another very important aspect that the Pope speaks about is that sometimes the Bible is not comprehensible to us. And what we have to do is accept that God's Holy Word, sometimes God's Holy Word is a mystery, as is so much of our faith. At the end of the consecration at Mass, when the priest consecrates the bread and the wine and turns it into the body and blood of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, the great acclamation is, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. It's so much of our faith is a great mystery. So much what you're going to read in the Bible, you won't understand. And that's okay. It's okay not to get it. Give it time. That's why the reading of Scripture is a prayerful action and should be treated as such. Many times we don't get the fruits of our prayers, and this is where we trust God and His church. God answers all of our prayers in His time. 
See, we live in this hurried culture. We want everything like this. We want ans quick answers, quick solutions right away. And when we don't get them, we get all discouraged. Don't get discouraged in your prayer. Don't get discouraged in your reading of God's holy word. Persevere. Persevere. Be steadfast in your faith. Persevere. God does answer all prayers. I remember during this, this visit of my parents that I have just spoken to you about. I remember during my time at this, in the seminary, I used to go and visit my spiritual director all of the time. And I used to say to him over and over again, I don't know how I can be a priest. I don't know how I can be a priest. And this was the one time when I was in the seminary, in that per particular time, that I wanted to leave. And I wanted to leave the seminary. And, uh, and the reason for that is, as I told you uh, before, my parents are divorced. And so on this visit, it was my mom who visited and my stepfather. And my parents went through a very terrible divorce. As you know from your own life experience, um, if you haven't gone through a divorce yourself, you probably have family members who have. It's part of the day and age we live in. And so many times, there's all this pain that is involved, and not just pain for those who are getting divorced, but also for the children that are there and all the others who are affected. And it was, in the, it, it was the same in, in our case, in me and my brother's case and in my family's case. And a little bit after the divorce, my mom got together with my stepfather, and he moved in with us, moved in with me and my mother. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of friction. I resented that. I resented this because uh, I wanted my family back, right? I was a teenager at the time. I wanted my family back. And so there was a lot of friction between me and my stepfather. Lots of friction. A lot of insults back and forth. There was a lot of pain that was involved and I developed these really deep ill feelings towards him. Horrible ill feelings. You could even say hate. And this is one of the reasons why when I was in the seminary I had such a hard time in reconciling the fact that I was going to be a priest and at the same time having these Ill, Ill feelings inside of me, feelings of hate. And when I would go to speak with the spiritual director, my spiritual director, and I would tell him this, he would say, Adam, just persevere and pray. And pray. God will take care of this. You just trust and pray and persevere. And over time, I kept praying and praying, and God began to melt my heart and my stepfather's heart also. And those feelings of hate went away, but it was never to the fullest extent. And let me tell you, during this visit, talk about miracles, Talk about God's grace, God's gift, God answering prayers. It was the first time during this visit that I called my stepfather, and I don't know how, it just came out. The first time during this visit that I called my stepfather, Dad. I said, Dad to him. <laughs> That's grace. God does answer all of our prayers. God hears all of our prayers. Not on our time, but on God's time. 
God's ways, the Bible tells us, are not our ways. That time in my life was a very stressful time in my life. You know, and I hope that none of you judge me for having these feelings of hate uh, during that time in my life because of the stress that was involved. I blew up, to, I almost weighed 300 pounds, had, had to take medicine for blood pressure and other types of medicine. And all of us have issues, each and every one of us. I, because I am a priest, I'm not perfect, and yet the Lord has called me as imperfect as I am with all my imperfections, and the Lord has called each and every one of you sitting here today. The Lord has called you as well, not because of any merit that you have or any special gifts, but because He loves you. God loves you. And God has called you. And God is leading you. You are in His hand. All we have to do as His children is to trust Him. Trust the Lord and believe that He will answer all of our prayers in His time. And it's all going to be okay. That's the great promise of, of the Lord. That with the Lord all things are possible. That it's all going to work out one way or another, because He's with us. And that's the great solace of our faith. I want to tell you that I was about 12 years old, and this nun who saw me in our parish church, I got involved in our parish church because... It, before that time, my parents, there was a lot of turmoil in our household. You know, when my parents divorced, that wasn't just the, the, that was the culmination of the turmoil. But the turmoil was there ever since uh, we moved here to the United States. Uh, and I was in a McDonald's once, and I met these uh, Baptists. And they invited me over to their church. And the way they enticed me was they said that they were going to have pizza. <laughs> and they said, we have pizza. And as soon as they said pizza, they, I was sold. <laughs> well, I went to their church. And they, of course, they used the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And I learned a lot. But then one of my aunts found out. My parents had no problem with me going to the Baptist church. You know, they were dealing with their own issues and, you know, the people from that church would pick me up and take me to their church. But my aunt found out and she says, over my dead body. <laughs> she says, our whole family has been Catholic for generations and you will change religions for pizza? <laughs> And she dragged me to our local parish. <laughs> and there, there was a nun who really took a liking to me. And she said, have you thought about being a priest? And mind you, I was 12. <laughs> and I said, no. I do not want to be a priest. And she said to me, she says, well, I will pray that God gives you the vocation to be a priest. That was when I was 12. And when I was 14, I applied to the uh, high school seminary of the Archdiocese of Chicago. And here I am today. So, you don't think prayer works? <laughs> <laughs> prayer does work it's God who touches us who calls us who melts hearts who goes after us and so persevere persevere in your prayer for all the needs that you feel in your life the needs that 
you have for your family members and friends, your children, whatever needs you may be feeling. Persevere. God does listen, and God hears each and every prayer. And so, let us now go to the readings for this coming Sunday, which are so powerful. The readings of October 18th. We have our first reading from the book of Isaiah. And of course, the book of Isaiah is quoted by our Lord Jesus in the Bible. The book of Isaiah is, from the prophet Isaiah, is quoted so many times in the New Testament. It is present in the... It is present in the... Old Testament. And so listen as you take in these words of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. The word of the Lord. And so, this idea of the suffering servant that is presented here in the book of Isaiah. Jesus is the suffering servant. For as we will hear in the gospel today, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' life was given for all of us in service to each and every one of us. He gave his life for us that we might have life and have it in abundance. And he suffered in his life here on earth. He went through the cross to reach the resurrection. Our life too is about bearing our crosses, bearing the cross that we have been given in our life and awaiting the glory of the resurrection, but never being so focused on the glory of the resurrection that we forget about the necessity to bear our cross. That is the great temptation. That you forget the here and now. Being so focused on the fact that one day I'm going to be in heaven. That I forget to deal with the reality that I'm living in. We have to deal with the here and now. The problems, the issues, all that we go through, we have to deal with them and accept them. Jesus was the suffering servant. He accepted his suffering. He didn't run away from it. And we are to do likewise. Not run away from our suffering, run away to the comfort of heaven, being so removed from reality that we forget to endure patiently all that comes our way and to offer up all that comes in this life. Offer it up. How many of us need to learn that in our daily living? To offer up our hurts, our insults, our marital problems, our aches and pains, our employment problems, maybe you're going through troubles at work, to offer those up, problems with your children, to offer them up. And not to run away from them. That is a great lesson we can learn from the suffering servant who served. Jesus was all about serving those around him. 
Am I? Am I all about the people who are around me? When I get up in the morning, do I think about all that my husband is going to do for me today? Or do I get up in the morning thinking, how am I going to make his day better? When he returns home from work, I have his beer ready for him, all nice and cold. <laughs> I have a nice pillow waiting for him on his, uh, uh, on his recliner, all puffed up. And I say, honey, have a seat. Let me take your shoes off. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner will be ready in just a little bit. You've got his favorite show on. <laughs> we all could learn to put up with one another in our lives. Rather than always trying for other people to serve us, for us to become the servants of all, in the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm always reminded of the story of the burned biscuit. When a wife who's been at work all day comes home and makes breakfast for dinner. You know breakfast for dinner? Okay. And she didn't just make pancakes, but she also made sausage and bacon okay and then she made biscuits and she burned the biscuits that happens <laughs> she burned the biscuits and the husband is there at dinner with their children and all he does is he takes some jelly and smears it on the burned biscuit and says mmm yummy <laughs> and, and enjoys his burned biscuit. And later on, at night, his six-year-old son asks him, Daddy, do you really like burned biscuits? <laughs> and the father says to his child, No, I really don't. But you know, your mother has had a hard day at work. And a little burned biscuit hasn't hurt anyone once in a while. We could all learn to put up with the burned biscuits that we are served with in our life, rather than to complain all the time about the burned biscuits that life serves us on a daily basis in our life. We could all learn to put up with the burned biscuits. So I say to all of you, Pass the burned biscuit. <laughs> As we all could learn in our lives. Do you know how many burned biscuits I have to put up with? <laughs> That's life. Whenever somebody comes to me and says, Father Adam, I have all of these problems. Oh. I suffer. Oh, I suffer. Oh, I can't take it anymore. Oh, you know what I say? Welcome to the club. <laughs> we all suffer. We all suffer. All of us. That's life. You can't escape suffering, even though we all try to in this life. We all try to escape suffering because. We don't want to be people of service. We don't want to give of ourselves. And this is the problem with the gospel reading that we have today. Let's look at the gospel for today. This is from... We are continuing in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Jesus replied, What do you wish me to do for you? They answered him, 
Grant that in your glory we may sit one at your right and the other at your left. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, We can. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or at my left is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at James and John. Jesus summoned them and said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones make their authority over them felt. But it shall not be so among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. And so in our life, we don't want to serve. What we want is we want power. We want power. That's what we want. We don't want a call to service. And so the question here for us tonight as we hear these readings is, do I seek for others to serve me? Or do I seek to serve. Remember, Jesus said, for I have come to serve and not to be served. And we are to imitate Jesus. One world, one word can be used to describe what is going on in our world today. And that is the word power. Power. It is the ability to influence or control people's lives. Like political power. People want power. Like political power, for example. Political power like the power that Barack Obama has, right? Or financial power like that of Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> or spiritual power like that of Pope Francis. Or star power like that of Celine Dion. One sure sign of power is that people want to get near the people who have it. That's why they usually have bodyguards and tinted windows, right? People want to get near them to get some of what they have. People have this hope of getting some of the power that they have. That's why they're hoping that some of that power is going to rub off on them. Well, this is how the world has worked from the beginning. A fascination with power. When the powerless become powerful, they often become just as heartless, if not more, than the powerful that they replaced. That's what history teaches us. And yet, most of us live with the hope of achieving power. If only I got rich, people think, right? Yeah. If only I got rich. Woo! If only I got famous, right? If only I had this job, right? If only I lived in this house, in that neighborhood. I used to think for a long time, especially when I weighed around 300 pounds, if only I had the body of Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, Lord, why do I have these spare tires, you know? <laughs> this is the thinking of the world. It is not the thinking of God. These are not the ways of God. Remember, when Jesus is tempted in the desert, and the devil says, you're hungry, turn those stones into bread. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And when Peter is rebuking Jesus, right, what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking 
not as God does, but as man does. To have the mind of God is to have the mind of service. You see, the idea of Christianity, Christianity originally was called the way. The way, el camino. Okay, you've heard of the Camino of Santiago in Spain? Even there is a, that movie, The Way? Okay, well that's where they get that from. Because that's what Christianity was originally called, the way. We are on the way to where? To heaven, right? But in order to get to heaven, you got to go through the way first. You have to go through the way. You can't get to heaven unless you go through the way. And the way to heaven is through the cross. It's through the cross. The, that's why Jesus says, you gotta, if you want to be his follower, you've got to pick up your cross every day and follow him. Every day. So it's not a one-time thing. It's not like, I'm saved, and then boom. No, 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 no. It's an everyday thing. Every single day. I pick up my cross every day. You might have addictions in your life. And you might get all discouraged in your prayer and in your walk with the Lord because you say, oh Lord, I have all of these addictions and I can't seem to get rid of them. How am I going to get through this? You know, I want a quick solution. There are no quick solutions. It's an everyday struggle. Life is a struggle. You pick up your cross every day. You get up in the morning and you say, mm, another day, I got to walk, I'm on the way, I got to walk every single day. The sons of Zebedee that we heard about, James and John, they had just had Jesus tell them that following him would mean suffering, rejection, problems, death, and none of this seems to register in them. Why? Why isn't it registering? Because they are focused on power. They are like so many of us, right? We are focused on heaven because heaven represents power. I'm going to have glory there. Praise. Eternal happiness. We're so focused on heaven that we forget the cross. Hello? We forget the cross. We're, so, we're, we're just like them. And yet Jesus has just told them, listen, you're going to face problems, rejection, death. You know, you might, you might be killed, folks. He's telling them, and yet they don't, they don't want to hear that. That just passes right through them. They're all about, you know, the glory. They have seen how powerful Jesus is, and people following him everywhere, right? He can heal people. He can raise people from the dead. And so, they do not want suffering. They do not want problems. They do not want death. They don't want any of that. Like all of us, right? We don't want suffering. We don't want problems. We don't want death. We want heaven. We want glory, right? We want power, not suffering service. This is why the wealth gospel or the prosperity gospel preached by so many mega churches today is so very powerful and so very influential and so many people go there. Why? Because they want power. I want to be rich and wealthy. And when we hear what we want to hear, we like it. And a lot of you here might not be hearing what you want to hear because I'm telling you that Christianity is about the cross. Not about, it's not about focusing on the glory of the resurrection. That comes, but you got to go through the boot camp first. This life is a boot camp. Mm -hmm. And what, what do people do when they're in boot camp? <laughs> They endure and they do not complain, right? Left, right, left, right, right? <laughs> Drop down and give me 50, okay? <laughs> and you do it because you're in boot camp. What is the attitude that I have in leading this life? Do I complain in the boot camp all the time? 
And that's why maybe I'm leading such a miserable life. Maybe, you know, because I'm, I'm so focused on the glory that I should be having that I forget about the suffering that comes in this life. Jesus is calling us, Jesus is calling us to embrace our suffering. Did the microphone give out? Yes. Okay, Jesus, see the devil doesn't want you to hear this. Okay, that's what it is. Because this is revolutionary, right? The devil doesn't want you to hear. Jesus is calling us to embrace our suffering. And in our suffering, to find meaning. To find meaning in our suffering. In other words, as the Bible says, in order to find myself, I have to lose myself. In order to find myself, I have to lose myself. I have to die to myself in order to be born again. This is the whole idea of being born again. Right? Remember what Jesus says to Nicodemus in the Bible? Right? He says what? You have to be born again. Born again. Being born again is to die to my own self, my own selfish self, my own selfish passions and desires, the power that I would like to have in this life. And then I find myself. And when I find myself, I find peace. It's the gift of peace. The gift of peace. One book, write this, write this down, all of you that have your... One book that I recommend to all of you, that is at the top of my list. Absolutely at the top of my list. Thank you, Bayani. You're so kind. Isn't Bayani the greatest? <laughs> he is absolutely fabulous. And one book that I recommend to all of you that's at the top of my list is called precisely this the gift of peace and it is by cardinal joseph bernardine who was the archbishop of chicago when i was still living in chicago just the most wonderful man is an example of great love forgiveness and patience and he was diagnosed with cancer and he goes through that book, his experience of dying and the great gift of peace that God gave him. You see, you could have cancer in your body and you can have peace, right? You could have problems at home and you can have peace. You could be addicted to all sorts of things, but you can have peace. Oh, yes. Peace. That's the gift the Lord comes to give each and every one of us. And that only comes from freedom. When I die to myself and I'm born again, I become free. So stop complaining and start living in the midst of all that you have to go through. James and John are not focused on the storms raging all around Jesus. They are focused on his power, and they are so sure he will reign at the end that they are willing to go with him, because they are focused on the victory. Is that why you're with Jesus, because of the victory to come? You have forgotten about the cross? Did you forget about the cross? Maybe that's why it's so hard for you in your life, because you don't know that that's how it's supposed to be. The cross is part of our daily existence. Why am I here? Ask yourself that question. Is it all about eternal life and the glory to come? Have I forgotten that Jesus is asking me to live right here, right now, with the cross of my daily living? Am I so focused on ridding my life of suffering, problems, tribulations, obstacles, that I have forgotten that all of these and more have been promised to me on the way to the kingdom? James and John are sure of the promise to come, right? When Jesus is asking them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? What do they say? 
Sure we are. Of course. Of course we are. We're going to be in heaven. That's how sure they are, right? We're, we're, that's why we want to sit at your right and at your left in the glory to come. Because they are so sure of themselves. Jesus is not so sure though, right? He says, I don't think so. Because the road to victory is the way of the cross. The way of the cross. He isn't so sure that they are willing to go the way of the cross. Are you willing to go the way of the cross? It's a big question. We reach resurrection and glory by way of the cross. This they do not understand. And this we do not get either, which is why we spend our life trying to get rid of suffering. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus turns everything upside down. Have you, when you're reading the Bible, Jesus turns everything upside down. It's, it's the way that the world thinks is not the way of Jesus. Like, the end of the line is the best place to be. That's why he says, the last shall be first. That's not what the world says, right? The world doesn't say that. The, being the first is the best place to be. No, the last shall be first. The lowliest job is the one to covet. No, but we want to have the greatest job, right? Those who serve waiters are luckier than the ones in power. Lovers of God get less status, not more. All of this way of thinking is un incomprehensible in the world we live in. Things do not work this way in the world. So, what is the attitude that we should be praying for? What is the attitude that we should have? We should be praying for the mind of Jesus. To be able to endure our time here quietly and with no whining. And only then will we earn our seat in heaven on God's right and God's left. We serve not for a reward, but for the love of God. That's why we serve. Why is it that you want to be the suffering servant? Because you're expecting a reward in heaven? Is that why you want to serve other people? Is, 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 is the reason why you're nice to people, that you treat them nicely, that you do good things, that you want to put up with your husband and wife and you want to put up with the people in your life is, is the reason for that because you want to be rewarded in heaven is that why you do it or do you do it because you love God and if you love God you have to love other people because you can't say I love God and then hate other people or harbor ill feelings or not serve them the Bible is very clear those who say they love God but do not love people are liars because you can't love God if you don't learn to love people who you see. You can't love God who you do not see if you do not learn to love people whom you see. And that's hard, and you know that. Because people are tough to deal with. <laughs> people betray us, they hurt us, they inflict pain on us, and yet we are called to love them. Oh yes, we are called to love them. Now, we serve not for a reward, but we serve because we love God and because God has loved us. Serving Jesus means giving myself away daily to the people in my life. Serving Jesus is not serving an idea somewhere. You've got to serve the people in your life. That's when you serve Jesus. If you don't serve the people in your life, you're not serving Jesus. You're serving your own misguided idea. You know, it's like the people who, who say, I love you, God, right? But then are jerks to other people, right? <laughs> they don't love God. It's this thing in, in one of the parishes I was at uh, every Friday, we had adoration from the end of the morning mass. The morning mass was at 8 in the morning. And after the morning mass at 8, 
we, I would expose the Blessed Sacrament and we had adoration till 6 o'clock and then we had benediction at 6 o'clock. Well, it was a small parish. Not a lot of funerals would come in, but one particular Friday, a funeral came in. And I had to have it at 2 o'clock. And so I told the regular people who would come to the adoration, a small group of folks, you know, very religious folks. Be careful with the religious folks. <laughs> Okay. And I said to them, you know, I said to, the, to this group of know-it-alls, okay, okay, holier-than-thou people, okay, I, I said, listen, we're going to have to interrupt the adoration because I have to have a funeral. We have to have a funeral for this gentleman that has just died. Oh, you thought World War III had started. I mean, I couldn't believe this. They said, how could this happen? And I said, well, we have to have a funeral. Well, anyway, they came into the office and I was sitting in, in my office and they went and they were badgering the secretary. Father Adam doesn't respect the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> you know. He put Jesus in the corner. This is our time with Jesus, and he's taking it away. Well, I, I've about had it, you know. I'm normally not like this, but I opened the door. And I went out where, like, five of them were standing, and I said, You folks say you're people of prayer, right? Oh, yes, Father. <laughs> We are people of prayer. Of course we pray. We're people of prayer. I said, you said you're people of prayer? Yes. Stop. Stop praying. I said, stop. Stop praying. Because whatever you're doing is not prayer. Whatever you're doing is not working. Stop and start over. Because if your prayer doesn't lead you to have compassion, Compassion and understanding for this family that has just lost their loved one, for this grieving family that has just lost their loved one, that you cannot interrupt your adoration time for a couple hours, there's something wrong there. Whatever you're doing is not prayer. It ain't working. It's not leading you to God. Because God is love. God is love. God is compassion. And when we share love, we share God with one another. We have to learn to recognize God in each other. God is not some idea somewhere. God is real. And that's something we can all learn. You see, the God we have turns everything upside down. James and John wanted to sit at Jesus' right and left, right? And who... Who were the two on either side of Jesus? Who were the two on either side of Jesus? Criminals, right? Criminals. There were two criminals who were on either side of Jesus. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are not our ways. Behaving well is no guarantee of making it to heaven. Stop being jealous. Stop being envious of God's generosity. Your job is to serve and not to figure out who is in and who is out. Right? If you don't get it, if you don't get the ways of God, you're in good company. Peter didn't get it. James and John didn't get it. Right? And neither do many of us. It's so hard for us to get it. You know, let me tell you, no one ever really has fully gotten it. That's why we are on the way. It's called the way for a reason. We're not finished products. We are works in progress, all of us. Jesus continues to be with us, to feed us, and to serve us, and continues to give himself away for free to us, and calls us 
to do likewise. And if you haven't gotten it, pray. Pray. It's all a gift. It's a grace. Pray that the attitude that you may have is not the attitude, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you, because this is the attitude that we go to with Jesus so many times. Give me this, give me that, give me this, I, I want this, right? That's not our attitude. That's not the attitude we are called to have. The attitude we are called to have is this. Teacher, we want to do for you whatever you ask of us. Let's repeat that. Teacher, we want to do for you whatever you ask of us. Now turn to your neighbor and say, did you get it? And now turn to, the, turn to the other one and say, well, neither did I. <laughs> That's why I'm here. That's why we're here. As we conclude our time with prayer, the prayer that seeks for God to enlighten us so that we may get it in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we come before you with great humility this evening. We come acknowledging that we do not have all of the answers, Lord. Oh no, we do not. Not one of us here has all of the answers. But you do. You do have all of the answers. And in the response of Peter, we too say those same words. To whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. To whom shall we go? We are not just going to you, Jesus, but we are running to you. We are running into your loving embrace, knowing that you have the power to answer all of our needs, to feed us and to fill us with all that we need in our daily lives. The consolation that we need, the peace that we seek and the freedom that we are after. It is you, Jesus. And we pray today that in our lives we may have that attitude, not, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you, but teacher, we want to do for you whatever you ask of us. We pray for this grace today and every day as we say that prayer that you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. And this is the month of the Holy Rosary when we contemplate that beautiful prayer, that biblical prayer that leads us to the life of Jesus. We thank the Lord for the gift of the Holy Rosary. We thank the Lord for the gift of His Mother Mary that accompanies us, that helps us with our prayers as we call for her powerful intercession as we say hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners and at the hour of our death amen glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, never shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming. Go in peace. Come back.
Come back next week, next Monday. Tell your friends, okay? Bring more people. Bring a friend, okay? We want to see more people here. It's good to have all of you here. Thank you for coming. I know that we are competing for your time, and I, I, I treasure your time, and I, I really thank you for being here. Know that I, I, I do not take your, your time for granted. I know your time is precious. And so I really appreciate you coming. Thank you. God bless all of you. Have a beautiful evening.